Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I mean, isn't that amazing that God takes his time from running the world just to say to you, you got a bad attitude that's going to get you in trouble. Come on, sweetie, let's change it before you get in trouble. To me, that's awesome. It's like, wow, God cares that much about me. Well, Father, we thank you for the word today and look forward to hearing not from me, but from you. See what you have to say. Use my mouth and let everybody be attentive and get what they need in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right. I'm teaching from the 23rd Psalm this weekend. I mentioned that the last time I did this series was in 2003. So it's 11 years old, but thank God the word never gets old. And so I've only taught this one time, but there's a lot of wonderful messages in Psalm 23. This is kind of like our go-to Psalm. How many of you find that if you're really hurting and don't know what else to do, you'll go read Psalm 23? And so we're going to take a look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. Not just anybody's shepherd, but he's my shepherd. I shall not lack. We actually covered one verse last night. And this morning, we're going to cover another half of a verse. <laughs> you're like... Well, how in the world do you plan to get done? Oh, well, you just don't know me very well. I'll get done, trust me. I'll get down to the end and then fast forward. But um, I shall not lack doesn't mean that I'm always going to have every single thing that I'd like to have the moment I'd like to have it, but it means that while I'm waiting on God to do the things that I would like him to do, I can still be content. How many of you think contentment is, uh, hey, don't you just get tired of always being dissatisfied? It's time to just be content, and that only comes from trusting God. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. He leads me beside the still and the restful waters. He refreshes and restores my life, myself. Another translation says my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with him, not because I've earned it, but for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil because you're with me. Your rod protects me. Your staff guides me. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely only goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord and in his presence forever. Now, Verse 2, which we're not really going to teach on, but I am just going to mention, says, He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. That's referring to entering the rest of God. Hebrews 4 teaches us about a supernatural, a Sabbath rest. It's not a rest from activity, but it's a rest in activity. In other words, I'm working up here, and what I do is a lot of work, but I rest in my work, Because internally, I know that it's not my responsibility to make you like me and make you like what I say. And it, that's, that's God's thing. I've done my part. I've studied. I've prayed. I've shown up. I'm prepared. So we can enter the rest of God when we know what to do and we know what not to try to do. Amen. And a lot of times what we do is we don't do what we should do and we try to do what only God can do. And then we just get all messed up in doing that. Entering the rest of God, it's a beautiful place. Because when you're in the rest of God, you trust that God's going to take care of things. You don't know how he's going to do it. You don't know what he's going to do. You don't know when he's going to do it. And you're really not even all that concerned about it because you, you have this faith that God is faithful and he will not fail you and let you down. So when you enter the rest of God, whatever that might be about the changes you need in your life, the changes you want to see in people, the salvation of your loved ones, your, your finances, let me tell you something. No matter what kind of a problem you have, God's got an answer. He's got a plan. But when we're all frustrated and upset, we can't, we can't receive the guidance of God. So we need to enter the rest of God. And I like this verse too because it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So here's the thing. 
We can either choose to or he can make us lie down. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure some of you, you've been made to lie down. You got, you got in a predicament where you had absolutely no choice but to wait on God. So he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and the restful waters. He refreshes and restores my life, myself, my soul. Now, we're tripart being. We are spiritual beings first and foremost. We have a soul and we, we live in our body. We pay way too much attention to our body. Not that we shouldn't take care of it, but we don't need to adore it and spend all the time that we do making on over it. We need to be more concerned about our spiritual life and, and our inner life. And so our soul is a part of us that we can spend a lifetime never really understanding, but it's really the part that controls us. Our soul is our mind, how we think, our will, what we want, the choices we make, and our emotions. And I think most of us, if we're honest, would say that we probably recognize that people are led more by how they feel probably than any other single thing. What they think and what they feel. I always call it, I want, I think, I feel. I want, I think, I feel. We spend more time telling God and everybody else what we want, what we think, and what we feel. And God wants to renew our mind, teach us how to think the way he thinks. He wants us to use our free will to choose his will. Free will is a great gift, but it is also a great responsibility. I'm actually thinking about writing a book on the free will of man because I think that we really need to understand the power of our choices and that really God is giving each one of us an opportunity. He doesn't make us do what he wants us to do. He didn't want robots. If he would have wanted robots, that's what he would have created. He could have easily created us with no free will where we had no choice but to do what he wanted us to. But that's not relationship. So he gave us this amazing free will, and now he says, I set before you life and death, good and evil. Here's what I'd like you to choose, and if you do, everything will go well with you. So we grow in our relationship with God to learn to think like him, to learn to use our will to choose his will, and then we learn how to learn how to feel the heart of God and to feel the things that he feels and, and to enjoy feelings when they're good but realize that they're fickle and not let them rule us and control us. So it's a lifetime job. Yeah. How many of you know that's just not something that you get born again and next week that's all straightened out. That is a lifetime job. And, and that's good. That's good. We're in a process. And I'll tell you the truth, I've learned to enjoy it. I've learned to enjoy my walk with God uh, this may be sound a little bit odd to you, but I've actually learned to enjoy it when I receive correction from God because it lets me know that he cares about me. If God didn't care about us, then he'd just leave us alone. Now, it's easier for me to see, receive correction from God than from people, I will say that. Uh, so it's really best to get it first from God because if you don't take it from him, he will ultimately revert to working through people to tell you the same thing he tried to tell you 12 times that you ignored. <laughs> Amen. Um, so he wants to renew our mind. He wants us to use our will to choose his will and learn to learn that feelings are really neither good nor bad. I mean, they can feel good, they can feel bad, but we just have to learn that you really have to stop letting your feelings vote and make the, the decisions in your life. I still, uh, it amuses me when I think about a question that I was asked a few years back. Well, Joyce, how do you feel about all the traveling you have to do in order to do what you do? Well, you know, people think, oh, it must be so exciting to just travel all the time. Oh my gosh, the last thing in the world I want to do on vacation is go somewhere, you know? <laughs> I mean, when you've been in hotel rooms for almost 40 years, my, my, my. And so the packing, the unpacking, the, uh, I, I won't even go into it. But you know what? I liked my answer and I, it, was, it was really like, it was an interesting response that came out of my soul when they said, 
How do you feel about all the traveling you have to do? And I said, you know what? I haven't asked myself in a long time. <laughs> and maybe in order to get a breakthrough in your life and whatever area you're struggling with, you're going to have to stop asking yourself how you feel about it. Come on. You're going to have to ask yourself, stop asking yourself how you feel about it and just know if this is the will of God, then I'm using my free will to choose his will and it doesn't really matter how I feel about it. This is what I'm going to do. Amen? Stop letting your feelings vote. I'll use another example. You know, I had a lot of problems and hurts from being abused sexually by my father. And so by the time Dave and I got married, I was, I just wasn't that easy to deal with. And I don't think that Dave would have lasted two years in our marriage if he would have asked himself every day, how do I feel about the way she acts? <laughs> he probably wouldn't have come home very much at night if he would have asked himself, well, how do I feel about going home tonight? But see, he was committed. He was committed to our marriage and our relationship. And I think we're all smart enough to realize that although there are times when you have to call it quits, people give up way too easy today on far too many things. Come on, clap if I'm right. And you know what? It's because we just ask ourselves too much how we feel. We have forgotten the power of commitment. Amen. I am, I made my mind up 30 years ago, and I remember the verse that I was reading when I did is John 17, 4. Jesus said, Father, glorify me, for I have completed the work that you have given me to do. And when I read that, I started to weep and I said, God, if I don't do anything else in my life, I want to finish what you have given me to do. I want to finish my race and do all that you have asked me to do. So at that point, I had to stop voting on how I felt and what I thought, and whether I liked it or not, and I just got committed. Some things are more exciting than other things. Some are harder than other things. I don't like it when I get attacked in the media. There's, there's things about this I love. There's things about this that I don't love, but I'm gonna finish. Amen? And I wanna encourage you to be committed to what you believe God is asking you to do. If that's to be a mom, if it's to be a dad, if it's to own a business, if it's to be in ministry, if it's to get out of debt, if it's to get your health back, whatever it is, you need to be committed to do it and don't give up after a couple of weeks because you don't feel like doing it anymore. And by the way, this is all biblical. No discipline for the present seems joyous. Nevertheless, later on, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in another session. So, the mind has to be renewed. Our lives are wrong because our thinking is wrong. Our lives can't be right until our thinking is right. And the only way your mind can be renewed, the only way we can learn how to think right is to learn what God has to say. And there's power in the word that renews our mind. Just you being here this weekend is going to help you think differently in some areas and see things differently than the way you did before. Simply because you have come and parked your body here, you've opened up your heart, and now the word of God is going in, and the word of God has power in it that makes changes in our lives. James 1.21 says, Receive the word of God with meekness because it has the power to save your soul. Not your spirit. You can be born again and still need your soul saved. Your spirit, you've received Jesus in your spirit. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been made right with him. He's done a work in you, but if the mind is still messed up and the will is still messed up and the emotions are still messed up, then even though I may go to heaven someday in the sweet by and by, I'm going to have a miserable journey while I'm here, and I'm not going to be very fruitful in God's kingdom for him to use me in anything to help anybody else. And let me tell you something. If your mind is messed up, you're not going to have any peace. If we're constantly resisting everything that God wants us to do, then we're not going to have any peace. And I don't know if you've figured it out yet or not, but I've come to the conclusion I don't think life is even worth living if we're not going to have peace. Nothing is worse than being upset 
and frustrated all the time about something. So these areas of our life, mind, will, and emotions, they must be healed. They must be restored to their proper place, which is a back seat in decision making. Amen? And this requires mega doses. Healing in our life requires two things. Well, the Word of God, well, let's say three things. The Word of God, the mega doses of the unconditional love of God. It's, it's the love of God and knowing that God loves you right where you're at and that, I mean, to be honest, God's not gonna love you any more when you get your mind renewed than he does right now. <laughs> uh, he's not gonna love you any more if you become more obedient than he does right now. You say, well, then why should I do it? Well, because we're not doing what we're doing to get God to love us. We want to do what we do because we love Him and we want to please Him and live for His glory. We have to stop doing everything that we do to get something. We want to serve God because He's wonderful, because He's awesome, and He's amazing. You don't even have to have an excuse to like come to something like this conference. Just come and set apart that time with God just because He's awesome. He's just... Wow, God, you're amazing. Where would I be without you? What a privilege just to sit in a room full of other believing people and worship you and hear something that's going to cheer me up a little bit. I can promise you, you'll get enough bad news when you go back out the door. You might as well get all the good news you can get while you're in here. So it requires the Word of God and the unconditional love of God. But another thing that this maturing process requires is correction. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone that he loves. You know, interestingly enough, most people in prison will tell you that their parents either corrected them violently, which is not God's way, or they never corrected them at all. It's interesting, if we are without correction, then it makes us feel that nobody cares about us. I know we all think that we don't want to be corrected, but actually the truth is, is we do want right correction. For the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves, and he punishes, even scourges, every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. You must submit to and endure correction for discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not thus train and correct and discipline? Now, if you are exempt from correction and left without discipline, in which all of God's children share, then your illegitimate offspring and not true sons at all. So just to practice, even if you got to say it by faith, everybody say, I love God's correction. <laughs> you know what? The worst thing in the world that could ever happen to us would be for God to leave us alone in the mess that we're in and to never, ever change. That would be terrible. But you know, to be honest, if I'm going about my day and all of a sudden I'm starting to do something that I've forgotten I shouldn't do. And the Holy Spirit quickly reminds me that's, mm, that attitude's not good. You know, I don't have to go, oh boy, here I go again. Something wrong with me. Every time I turn around, it's always me, you know. <laughs> and that's the way I was when I was more of a, of a baby, more carnal Christian. Not that I don't still have a long way to go, but, you know, now I would see that like, oh man, God, thank you that you're, that you're paying that much attention to me that you can that you recognize every time I'm even about to have a bad attitude and you take your time from running the world. I mean, isn't that amazing? That God takes his time from running the world just to say to you, you got a bad attitude that's gonna get you in trouble. Come on, sweetie, let's change it before you get in trouble. To me, that's awesome. It's like, wow, God cares that much about me and surely I can then submit to that and have a good attitude and say, thank you, God, that you care enough about me to remind me before I get in trouble that I'm about to get in trouble. And this is our whole relationship with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended on high, he sent the Holy Spirit to represent him and take his place, and he said, I will never leave you. 
I will, I've been with you, now I will come to live in you, and I will be there to help you in every single thing in your life, but you gotta listen to me. Need to listen to me. And it really just gets to be, just gets to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Somebody's not sure yet, okay, well, we'll get there. <laughs> Revelation 3.19. See, we get too defensive when God shows us things about ourselves. It's like, oh, another thing wrong with me. Can't do anything right. Well, what about them? You don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, I remember well God dealing with me about so many, many, many things that I got so tired of. God, can any human being have this much wrong with them? <laughs> anybody know what I mean? It's like, can anybody have, I mean, I don't care what the message was, I needed it. It was like, I mean, I couldn't turn to a scripture that I didn't need. It was like, I needed it all. And, and, and I remember one time I was so tired of God dealing with me about stuff. And I remember going to Dave, because I'm thinking, well, Dave's got problems. I mean, he's got problems that I, you know, I don't ever hear him saying anything about God's dealing with me. And so I asked him, I said, is God dealing with you about anything? And he said, no, I don't think so. And oh, I got so upset with God. It's like, what is with this? God has given us free will, and free will is a great gift, but it's also a great responsibility. We have the ability to choose life or death. We always wanna make sure that we choose life. Zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory here. Prison. And I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen. En Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for a third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here. So they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still, and that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash partner. Zelfbewust te zijn heeft alles te maken met vertrouwen op God. Dit is precies waar het over gaat in het dagboek van Joyce. Je bent wonderlijk gemaakt. 
Vertrouw op God en weet dat je waardevol bent voor Hem. Hij geeft je de kracht om nieuwe dingen te doen en hiervoor je gaven in te zetten. God heeft je wonderlijk gemaakt om moedig en vrij jezelf te zijn. Met dit dagboek voor vrouwen ontdek je elke dag iets meer hoe kostbaar je bent voor God. Bestel je bent wonderlijk gemaakt door te bellen met 026 2022 100 of online via joyce-meyer.nl slash wonderlijk. Vragen? Bel ons op. Wij zijn er voor je. Telefoonnummer 026 20 22 100.